About half past the hour, welcome to Biz Africa. I'm Penina Karibe. A new report on oil theft in Nigeria has pointed out a direct link between the oil theft and international organized crime, with proceeds being laundered in world financial centers like Britain and the United States. According to the report by London based Chatham House, an estimated 100,000 barrels per day of oil was stolen from pipelines in the Niger Delta in the first quarter of this year. This is a direct threat, not just to revenues, but also to consumers safety and the environment. CCTV's Peter Akaba has more. According to the 70-page report entitled Nigeria's Criminal Crude, the old theft amounts to around 5% of Nigeria's current 2 million barrels per day production, but has a wider impact because oil companies are often forced to shut down pipelines due to damage caused by thieves. Nigeria produces 400,000 barrels per day, well below its capacity, mainly due to theft and pipeline closures. It's costing the government a lot of money. It's roughly about 5% of Nigeria's export levels in 2012. And um, it's causing devastating environmental damage. The activity costs Africa's second biggest economy an estimated $5 billion a year in potential revenue. According to the report, recent increases in global oil prices have also spurred the theft. Before 2000, it wasn't really worth stealing when the oil price was low. And now with oil at $100 a barrel and more, um, it's very, very lucrative business. With the theft on what has been termed an industrial scale, the report follows a trail that shows proceeds are laundered through world financial centers and used to buy assets in and outside Nigeria. The report named the United States, Britain, Dubai, Indonesia, India, Singapore and Switzerland as likely money laundering hotspots, and the United States, Brazil, China, Thailand, Indonesia and the Balkans as the most likely destination for stolen oil. The proceeds of stolen oil washing up in um, other countries' financial systems um, could compromise their banks, it could compromise their refiners, and um, it could compromise anybody who comes into contact with this oil. Nigeria's oil minister Diazani Alison Madweke has called for stolen oil to be labeled blood oil, arguing that the security risk is similar to those in past and present mineral conflict zones such as Angola, Sierra Leone or the Congo. But the Chatham House report suggested violence associated with the theft is less than reported although armed gangs have destabilized the oil producing Niger Delta in the last decade. It runs through possible options for foreign powers interested in curtailing the practice, such as genetic oil fingerprinting, sanctions, or regulating Nigeria's sales, but dismisses most of them as likely to do more harm than good. We identified five different countries that had a significant oil theft, but only one had, the, had it to the scale of Nigeria, and that was Russia. Nigeria is among the world's top 10 crude oil exporters and a key supplier to Europe, Brazil and India, providing billions of dollars in income for foreign oil and shipping firms, not to mention a local economy almost totally dependent on oil. Peter Kaba, CCTV. Now that report was received with a mixture of anger, frustration and disappointment in Nigeria, made worse by a perception that not much had been done to arrest the situation. The chief of the border kingdom in the Niger Delta, MAP, blamed the continued theft to well-connected individuals who were protected by some government officials. You read every day about, oh, it's 400,000 barrels of oil being lost, crude, being lost in this country. And it's spoken of as if it is a normal thing. When we were in government, it was even, I think it was 100,000 at the point in time, and they worked assiduously, and then it reduced to some 50,000. I think I remember those numbers, like yesterday. And today we're talking 400,000, and it's like it's normal. It's not normal, guys. It is the Nigerian state and the international oil companies that collaborate together that steal the oil. 
and saying in Nigeria, a London court has been told that Governor James Ibori tried to bribe anti-corruption boost Nuhuri Badu in 2007 with $15 million in cash. The alleged bribe was supposed to stop a probe into his finances. Ribadu told the court that he pretended to take the bribe because he wanted the cash as evidence to use against Ibori in a prosecution. Ibori was governor of all producing Delta State in southern Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. In 2012, he pleaded guilty at London Southwark Crown Court to 10 counts of fraud and money laundering and was jailed for 13 years. African entrepreneurs are increasingly getting enticed to southern China by riches made from trading low-cost goods back home through the financial hub of Hong Kong. A group of Africans are making it big from the Chongqing mansions in Hong Kong, where the bulk of goods pass through en route to Africa. CCTV's Clementine Logan has that story. Ali Diallo sells Chinese electronics to retailers across Africa. The 39-year-old from Guinea is part of a growing number of African entrepreneurs thriving in southern China as trade between the world's second largest economy and fastest growing continent soars. Here Diallo welcomes the latest delivery of mobile phones made in China to his office in Chongqing mansions. The building is also the go-to place in Hong Kong for African buyers in search of affordable electronics, with phones selling from around $8 each. His company sees an annual turnover of $11 million a year from the sales of phones and tablets alone. In China, there are opportunities for people who can start uh, from scratch and build up their own business, obviously not in one day, but uh, through hard work and uh, networking, you can do it. Trade between China and Africa hit new highs of nearly $200 billion last year. Gordon Matthews says that up to a fifth of all mobile phones in Africa have passed through the building's corridors in recent years. At least 20,000 Africans live in the city, according to research from Sun Yat-sen University. And although their number is a fraction of the million Chinese now living in Africa, these migrants are playing a pivotal role in their new home. You've got these African uh, entrepreneurs who are ethical, and who also are successful, and uh, the role they play is of enormous importance. For now, booming Sino-African trade continues to attract new waves of African entrepreneurs drawn to the shores of Guangzhou in search of the Chinese dream. Clementine Logan, CCTV. You're watching Bees Africa. Let's take a break coming up. The Eastern Cape of South Africa turns to wind power with liquid plans for a new 80 million kilowatt plant. Is Asia. Asia means business. Welcome back to Biz Africa. Alternative energy generation will soon be a reality in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. Earlier this week, a wind farm on the outskirts of Port Elizabeth saw the installation of three 140 meter high wind turbines that will provide electricity to three local communities in the area. Here's CCTV's Angela Coppola with that story. The wind farm is part of government's renewable energy independent power producer procurement program and integrated resource plan and will help ASCOM's drive to put power back into their regional grid. When it comes on stream early next year, the farm will generate 80 million kilowatt hours per year. 
The 550 million rand project is eight months into construction and the company was keen to use local labour. We've contracted with Newport and they actually recruited in the local communities so already there's 84 new jobs being created from very close communities and if, if you ex ex extrapolate that a little bit there's, there's around 120 uh, local community jobs already created. Community involvement during the entire project life cycle is critical. The environmental impact assessments were thoroughly done before construction commenced. During the construction phase there were other minor challenges. For us it was also a, a new learning to, to be involved with the Chinese company Sinovel. So to, to, to really understand the relationships and the cultural, that, that was, was challenging for us to do. And, and, and it was great that at this point in time we, we've built those relationships. The project has been structured to keep the local community involved at all levels. It includes an annuity stream of 1.5% of annual revenue, which will go into socio-economic and enterprise development projects. Renewable energy has come to the Eastern Cape and the wind farm that we're currently on will probably be commissioned in January. It will service the three communities in the area and also provide excess power that it generates into the grid going back into Port Elizabeth. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV in Port Elizabeth. And staying in South Africa presently, business, labour and government people got together for the 18th National Economic Development and Labour Council Summit in Johannesburg. The summit comes at a critical time in the country's history as it battles strikes, high unemployment and low economic growth projections with the general election scheduled for 2014. Our labour relations environment has become increasingly conflictual and extremely violent. It continues to place strain on our economy. On the other hand, we have to take responsibility of asking why workers have lost patience with us. But the rise in unprotected strikes means that we need to go back to the drawing board and revisit the collective bargaining framework and begin to ask tough questions. The targets set out in the NDP are ambitious and achieving them will require stakeholders to embark on an approach that will require more than just a business as usual approach. South African coal producers have made a revised above inflation wage offer to its employees. The move is seen as a way of averting industrial action in the sector. The producers, who include units of global mining giants Anglo American and Glencore, made a final offer of pay hikes ranging from 7 to 11 percent, which is above consumer inflation levels. The offer says salaries will increase by inflation plus 1 percent in 2014, with a guaranteed minimum of 7.5 percent. The Solidarity Trade Union and the National Union of Mine Workers and UM said the workers are until Monday to accept, reject or propose changes to that offer. A coal strike would be further bad news for Africa's largest economy which was hit by the brief shutdown of the gold sector and a far more serious one in the automaking sector that cost companies two billion dollars in lost revenue. We're now joined by CCTV's Angela Kupla, who has been following this story from Johannesburg. It's coming to us live from Johannesburg. Angela, good to see you. So obviously South Africa cannot ignore the issues of labor unrest in that country. What solutions did the summit propose? Well, the bottom line is the plenary session that we were in, there weren't any solutions that we heard of. There were two sessions that happened quite soon after the plenary session where the different constituents got away and sat down and had a discussion. We do know from what Minister Shabane was telling us is that NEDLAC probably needs its mandate refocused. And a business leader we spoke to this morning also said that groups have already been formed to kind of look at how to make NEDLAC more effective and more efficient. But the bottom line here is, as Minister Oliphant was saying, there seems to be some bad faith negotiating going on between parties. So at the moment, there's, there are no solutions being offered. There's a fair amount of finger, point go, for, uh, finger pointing going on. Back to you. So obviously, and one of the things that the, the Labour Minister said is that both business and Labour uh, are to blame for the current strife within the country in the labour relations market. Are we likely to see a situation where both sides are softening towards ending that strife? Um, I wouldn't hold my breath hoping that there's going to be a solution anytime soon or that they're going to soften their approaches. 
Businesses, as you know, have to report to shareholders and owners, and the unions generally have to report and be responsible to their members. So there's always going to be that conflict there. But, I mean, Minister Shabani was talking to us, and he mentioned adversarialism, and it's, there's an increase in this advers adversity that's going on amongst uh, unions and business. And in the mining sector, for example, we know the gold mine, uh, the gold sector is kind of resolved, but Amku is still sitting on the sidelines. They've issued a letter uh, to the gold producers saying, they're not happy with that increase and they're going to be holding out for some more. And bear in mind that AMCU hasn't even got into their stronghold, which is the platinum sector, where they own a fair amount of members there. So we're talking adversarialism. We're probably going to see a very much more of that coming through in the next couple of months as the platinum strikes uh, or the negotiations in the platinum sector start again. Back to you. So, Angela, what more proposals then were fronted at the summit towards South Africa's economic growth? You know what, we're listening to the, the key constituents, which are com the communities, labor, business, and government, it seems that it's more of the same. The unions want a living wage, which they say they're not getting because um, inflation's eroding what their wo workers work home with. Uh, business is saying they want to see more impl implementation of policies. And government is saying, look, business, labor, you guys better start playing and uh, talking to each other because we want to see those NDP targets that we put out for employment and for growth being met. So we're we're sitting at a kind of a very sensitive stage at the moment where lots of finger pointing, no discussion, no fin finality on anything right now. Back to you. All right, Angela, thanks very much for those insights and have a great weekend. Angela Coppola, live for us from Johannesburg. Now to some auto news. A prototype of the world's most expensive model car, a gold plated and diamond encrusted Lamborghini, is on display in a showroom in Dubai. The model Aventador LP704 Coupe is a 22 carat gold plated replica of the one which RGE, Robert Gulpen Engineering in Germany, is planning to craft out of solid gold and Precious gems valued at about two point nine million dollars. Once completed, the twenty five inch model, a scale of one to eight of the real four hundred thousand dollar sports car, will go up for auction. The starting price of the pimped Lamborghini will be about seven point eight million dollars. Ten percent of the proceeds will be donated to charity. Now, according to the manufacturers, the model will scoop three Guinness World Records entries one, the most expensive and precious model car in the world, then the most luxurious logo, and the world's most secure show. Case. Well, as we wrap up this Africa, let's have a look at what the major bourses have been doing today. So last day of trading this week, Nigeria All Share Index ending the week up with almost about one of a percent, one percent. The JSC All Share Index ending the week with down in the red with a half of a percent. Nairobi Securities Exchange in the green with 0.13 percent. And the EGX as always every Friday closed for prayers. Thanks for watching Biz Africa. Famida back to you.